Welcome back to Cool Conversations. There's good news and there's bad news uh, on today's episode. The good news is we have a fabulous, glamorous, charismatic guest for you. The bad news is we're back online using Zoom. So just bear with us in case we have any tech hiccups. Now this girl, this girl is something special. She likes to be known as an adventure athlete and the founder of the youth empowerment tribe, I suppose you can call it, called uh, Trailblazers. I know her more for her amazing challenges, a two times Ironman completer, if that's the right word. She's cycled to Paris from London numerous times. She's raced across America on a push bike. She's climbed uh, summits in the Alps and cycled between them. She's done all sorts of things. And now, if that's not enough, she's embracing what I know as van life with an amazing van conversion, which she is, is now using for her own adventures. And if this isn't enough, this is all on the back of having a proper corporate career many years ago, which she sacked off in pursuit of adventure. She is, of course, none other than the glamorous Sophie Radcliffe. Sophie, how are you? You good? Oh, I'm really good, thank you. All, all of my fellow for having this conversation with you. And yeah, that's, that's an intro. Thank you. <laughs> so let's, let's just dive straight in. Trailblazers. Now, I know quite a bit about it. Uh, we've talked about it in the past together. Just explain the premise behind it for our uh, viewers and listeners. Of course. Trailblazers, it's a, it's a youth empowerment project, as you said, that I set up. And yeah, I love to think of it as a tribe as well. Um, basically, it's to build confidence, courage and resilience in teenage girls. And the, the reason I set it up is because we have a mental health epidemic in uh you know in, in in within teenage girls and i just i know that we're going to get onto this later about my journey with adventuring and how it changed my life and how you know really for me everything that i've learned through climbing all these mountains and doing all these challenges has been about becoming confident in myself and building the courage to go out and live the life that i dream of and be the person that i want to be and so after years of doing all these adventures i decided that I'd learned so much from the mountains that I wanted to go and, and create a classroom for these young girls that don't have that kind of support and, and, and motivation and, and confidence themselves and give them the skills to go and live the lives that, that they deserve to live. Now, I mean, that's a really interesting one because obviously I'm not going to ask your age, but I know that you are significantly younger than I am. Um, but there's this really interesting thing that, from what you're explaining to me, that's something which a slightly older generation normally has the appetite to set up. So we had, for instance, Conrad Anker on uh, a few weeks ago, and he, you know, he, he's a brilliant in terms of his mentorship of the younger generation. Now, I put you still in the category of the younger generation, yet you've gone ahead and set this up anyway. I'm just re I'm, I'm really impressed with that, and I'm just curious as to where that appetite. You now you said that you had your own confidence issues, and you've learned from your own journeys. But to set it up at such a young age, that's fairly unique, is it not? I mean, for me, it's I've always wanted to do something of value with my life, to have an impact, to create a legacy, and um, I just I have a burning desire to not only to explore my own potential, but to help others where I see a potential in them. And I, and I can identify, I'm a very deep thinker. So I've like, you know, when I go and climb a mountain or go and do an Ironman, I'm not completing the challenge. I'm completing the challenge and thinking every step of the way about the mind-body connection, about mindset, about what I'm learning from it. You know, so, so then to be able to take all of that and go, to young girls and I'm not saying to them go and climb a mountain or, or do an Ironman you know but it's taking those first steps and it's realizing the power of self-belief and realizing the power of negative self-talk and giving them the the tools to be able to, to to kind of like to pick themselves up because there is so much pressure 
um, they are literally just completely buckling. And for, for girls that perhaps don't have like the home support or, um, you know, or just the, the kind of the strength within themselves to rise above that pressure and the criticism and the judgment, you know, for me to be able to come in and say, hey, look, we're going to go and do things that you've never done before. We're going to help you feel a way that is free from all of this, this stuff that's pulling you down. You know, I've, I've created an adventure camp for 50 girls where some of them had never seen the sunrise over the, over the ocean before. And they're literally standing there looking at the sunrise. And then later in the day, they're coming up to me and they're like, look, Sophie, the sun rose from there, but now it's over there in the sky. And I was like, you know, some just so phenomenal. Um, we took, I took 10 girls sailing on a boat around the southwest coast of, of England. And, it, you know, I never, it's like watching a David Attenborough program where they speed up the growth of a plant by doing a time lapse. It was watching people change with my own eyes like that was just absolutely phenomenal. And some of them wanted to be on the boat and they wanted to grow and they wanted to learn. Some of them were there because their parents or their teachers had said, you know, you've got to be on that boat with Sophie. And um, and we had all kinds of arguments from, you know, I don't want to do the washing up and uh, it, hurts, it hurts my hands and, you know, this, that and the other. But what we had at the end was a group of 10 girls that said, that had never the way that they felt when they stepped off the boat they said they never felt that way in their lives before and they were ready to go forth and to create change and to change their social groups and change the way that they were thinking about their futures and you know and that's just something that I'm deeply deeply passionate about being part of. And, and what, what, so the, you mentioned the pressure that these girls are under where does that come from is that is that a modern or, or sort of a more modern era through the power slash dangers of social media or is it coming through some other um, avenue such as you know friends or family or schooling where, where does that pressure on those individuals come from it's coming from every single direction that you can ma imagine so it's coming from schools the pressure within schools is and um, you know you've got kids i'm sure you, you yeah. you've seen this with them it's uh, it's escalating out of control every single year it's getting more and more pressure they're bringing you know the they it's just it's just really hard for them they don't actually have time i don't feel to just go and play and just to be teenagers and just to mm. you know they're so obsessed with not doing anything unless it's perfect or unless it's going to be you know right so they don't try at all um the social media is a huge thing the kind of the sort of the bullying that goes on there. Um, in a lot of schools that I've worked with, it transpired that one of the biggest throwaway comments that kids give to other kids is, and this is it's you should just go kill yourself. And they, they genuinely would say that. All the schools I went to, they were like, yeah, people would just come up to you and say, oh, you're really stupid or you're fat or you're this or you failed that exam, you should just go kill yourself you know, and not realising that there's an actual implication of those words that are being said to somebody's mental health. And they, you know, and, and that's why it just, I don't know, it really upsets me. Um, uh, and, and, and I presume it is, a, I suppose, in many ways, is a throwaway comment, but it obviously has a deep impact on the person receiving it and possibly a yeah. lack of ownership from the person that, that's flung it out there. You know, there's, there's no real yeah. regard for the damage it's doing, uh, which arguably yeah. makes it doubly difficult because the one on the receiving end feels, feels bad and she would see that the, the individual that's thrown it out there has total disregard for it, uh, making it doubly impactful. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, social media, isn't it? Because I know that you caught social media in the way that I do to a certain extent. It can be a very powerful tool. At the same time, it can be utterly destructive. And it'd be, be interesting. Where, where, where do you think social media is going to go? I, I mean, I hope that social media will come back to the, the sort of the community aspect of it. Like, so, so when I first, when I, before I quit my job, everybody was talking about Twitter. And I was like, what are you talking about? You know, and they're like, oh, it's this really cool app where you can go on and you can see what David Beckham had for breakfast and this, that, and the other. And I was like, why would I care what other people are doing? Oh, come <laughs> you know, on. Doing... David Beckham's pretty hot. I, I'd want to see what he's had for breakfast. <laughs> I was like, why would I care what he's had for breakfast? Whatever. Then I got on it and it was, I, I was quitting my job. I was training for my first Ironman. And it was this amazing community where people were 
literally making friends with other people who wanted to have the same values or same aspirations in life. Whereas, you know, so often you might, you might want to do an Ironman, but your friends and family might say, that's crazy. You know, don't you know, it's going to be so much training. Why would you want to do that? So to go on a place on your phone where you can connect very easily with people that have the same goals and, and aspirations is really powerful. And we all used to be like messaging each other being like, I've been for a run and I've been this. And, you know, it was just, in my opinion, social media was just a lot easier. Mm. And then, you know, once things just things just sort of change and it becomes so much more pressure. And that's why a lot of the young people have moved to TikTok because they don't want it to be kind of perfect and, and all this kind of stuff. But for me my focus with social media is my community. And I, that's why I love like, um, my London to Paris sportive that I run every year where I have like, you've got to come do it by the way. I'm not sure I could keep so, up. So, so that, that, that's your, that, that's your London to Paris. Yeah. Uh, and is that, is that not, is that a 24 hour nonstop thing you do? Or is that over a couple of days? Yeah. No, it says so 24 hours. So the challenge is to cycle 200 miles from London to Paris in 24 hours. And um, I usually have about 100, 150 of my community come on the ride. And it's just, it's just amazing. And it's basically, I did that as one of my first challenges back in like 2008, when I literally just had a bike and could barely cycle, couldn't change a tire or anything. And I just, I was like, let's go, let's cycle to Paris. Um, it completely changed my life. And I think that normally 24 hours can go by in the blink of an eye. So to actually go and achieve something you know, really incredible. You don't have to, it's not this monumental thing. It's like, you don't need much equipment. You can go and just do it. Mm. And you, you've got to have that drive to do it. So anyway, I'm really passionate about London's Paris, which is why I've set up this event. And it brings together my community from all over the world. And people come back like three or four years in a row because they met people there and they want to come and back and do it again. And it's so, it's so incredible to like, imagine bringing like, hundred of people you know that you knew and like creating a festival in Chamonix or something like that you know and really sharing everything that you love and everyone gets to go, you know it's just it's really amazing and I hope that social media is going to be much more focused on on that in the, in the future. Yeah I mean, it, it is interesting how the various platforms seem to ebb and flow but many people view Twitter now as quite an angry platform uh, yeah and uh, <laughs> even our our uh, sort of bushy-haired friend from both this side and the other side of the pond seem to be quite ferocious on it these days. And it, it's know. always become a political platform. And you said yourself that a lot of the younger generations are now on TikTok. I myself took a step back from Twitter and just focused on uh, Instagram for a while. But it's, it's a really interesting dynamic, isn't it? Because let's face yeah. it, we don't actually need it. No. Yet it can be such a positive tool if used in the right way. Um, yeah. So it'll be, be really interesting to, to see where it goes. Now, you, you mentioned Chamonix. Um, we need a little bit of your... Uh, there's so much I want to talk to you uh, today about. I, I don't quite know where to begin. I'll tell you where we'll begin. Uh, so, obviously, you are Sophie. Uh, but tell us about almost your alter ego of challenge Sophie, because I know that's evolved over time hasn't it so yeah what does challenge sophie encompass uh so you, i mean challenge sophie was something that began with my, my mom around the kitchen table you know i <laughs> just like i think when i was in my first challenge she got me a hoodie and it just said challenge sophie 2008 on it i love that and uh, and, uh, and then uh, you, you know you've got a market though so you, you, you do the, yeah. like, the limited edition challenge sophie tops that'd be that'd be great yeah, and here we are, you know, what, long, 10 years later or something, and it's just, it's a totally different thing. So essentially, it started because I needed a challenge. I was 20, 21, 22, recently graduated from university, gone, moved back to London. Um, I had all these wild aspirations of all these amazing jobs that I wanted to get and I, things that I thought I could do to, you know, live the life that I dreamed of and travel and give back and create, a, you know, an impact, all the kind of things. And the reality was I couldn't get any of those jobs. And I ended up getting a job doing sales, uh, working, you know, in, in a nine to five job in an office in Brick Lane in East London. And so, you know, I kind of threw myself into my job and was like, right, well, this is, you know, this is a job and it's, it's what, I, what I'm doing for now. So I'm going to throw myself into it like it's my dream job. But within six months, I was just, you know, I felt I knew I needed more, basically. 
And I felt like life just tries to put you into these boxes and, you know, and then you're supposed to be happy in that box because you're ticking a box. But actually, it, I, wanted, I wanted to explore so much more of myself and my potential in the world. Um, so I took that into my own hands and I, and I decided I needed a challenge. And this was 20, 2008. And the first challenge I did was an adventure race in the jungle of Borneo. Um, and I started getting fit. I started doing British military fitness uh, at classes in London's parks. And I got a bike and I started cycling to work. And, you know, I don't come from, like, I never went camping with my family when I was young. I, the first time I climbed a mountain was, yeah, early 20s. Um, the first time I ever went hiking was when I was, like, 16. Um, I wasn't fit at school. I wasn't sporty. I didn't go, I went to school in central London. So this whole world started opening up to me and it was very new to me. Mm. But it felt amazing and it was making me feel so alive and you know, I just, I even loved like doing press ups in the park in the rain and, you know, having an, an army guy there being like telling you what to do. I just, it's, it's got a broom on the back it. of your neck and, and rubbing your face into the dirt. No, they weren't that bad. They weren't oh, okay. that bad. <laughs> you know, and then, and then we went off in this, um, this challenge in the jungle and there were 40 of us. Uh, lots of us were all from London. We didn't know each other. And all of a sudden we're thrown into the jungle together and we spend a, a week like adventure racing, doing all kinds of, you know, wild fun stuff like making camps in the middle of jungle and kayaking whitewater rafting climbing mount kinabalu running cycling like all that stuff and it just completely changed my life because when i finished that challenge it was a light bulb moment for me and i was like this is it this is where i'm going to feel alive to find out who i am to challenge myself and i didn't want to just throw in the the towel on, on like building my career and earning money and, you know, trying to create some sort of success and credibility for myself in what I was doing in my work. But I wanted to dedicate more of my life to this new world and just see where it went. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. Um, I came back to work and I just started like doing one challenge. Like then the next thing I wanted to do was to climb Mont Blanc. And I found a mountain guide and went on um, an Alpine apprenticeship course with Plazzy Brennan. Yeah. You know, I was the I was the classic person. I had no clue. Who, who but was I, the mountain guide out of interest? Oh, I have to I have to remember. Um, but I, I I had no idea. But I didn't go into anything pretending that I did. You know, I never turned up saying like I I can do. You know, I but I had so much drive and passion that people often took me under their wing mm -hmm. and they were like, you know, she's got this, this guts and this determination to go and achieve and clearly see that I had these big dreams. Um, and I was just prepared to like start from the beginning and just learn the ropes. And it was just incredible. It was this journey for a couple of years where I was like going and doing, you know, going climbing Mont Blanc on my, on my summer holiday in Chamonix and then or cycling London to Paris on a weekend or doing an adventure race in Scotland or going ice climbing in February in, you know, in the freezing conditions. And everyone thought I was completely nuts. They were like, why don't you just like go on holiday to a beach like a normal person? But, <laughs> I was like, no. I suppose that is a bigger question, you know, like a normal person. What, what is a normal person? Now, um, you know, I, I know that you went to York and studied philosophy. So you're probably in a far better place. And, and perhaps that actually would answer some of the, the reasons why you do what it is that you do and you try to help others maybe is certainly when I dabble my foot into the world of philosophy which I'm, I'm not going to start going down because you're going to blow me away with your knowledge but it, it does <laughs> seem to be looking at the much bigger picture you know beyond oneself a lot of the time and that's exactly what you seem to be doing so is there a connection with a younger Sophie wanting to study philosophy and the Sophie that we have now? Absolutely I, I mean I am um... Interestingly, my name actually, Sophie, means wisdom and philosophy means love of wisdom. Um, so they're both Greek and it's all kind of like, I don't know, I'm, I feel like my, my path is really what I was always ended up supposed to be doing. But just because there, there is a book, isn't there, which is the um, well, Sophie's World. Sophie's which, World, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's the philo philo philosophical ramblings of which particular philosopher is it about? I can't remember that. And it's about the only no, book I've never finished because I was getting I know, so, so irate reading it. 
I couldn't quite work out how somebody had written a bestseller pretty much based on somebody else's work. Uh, and I, I, I never quite finished it. I have to go back and finish that. Um, but but, but so, so your years at York uh, studying philosophy, just, what, what was that like? Because it sounds like you didn't find your adventurous streak till a little bit later. Oh, no. I was like total party girl at uni. <laughs> um, just, I mean, we had, what, five hours of lectures a week. A five week. Five hours? Five hours. I, I, I so I, chose the wrong course. But I talk to my friends and we just like remember how much time, how much fun we had and how much time we had to have fun. It just, it blows your mind. I mean, the things that we used to get up to just because we had all this time to just have fun. And, you know, we were always getting creative. Like York is not the, the, the nightlife capital of the world. Um, so it was very much like, you know, um, playing capture the flag and, just doing like fun stuff on the university campus just to just to yeah it was amazing I made so many of my best friends there I love studying philosophy um it was quite hard the course um but my what I did do I didn't do any adventuring um I didn't do any cycling any of the things I'm into now but I did row because I used to row when I was 16 and um, when I was at school so um I actually think that rowing is is an endurance sport and that kind of got me you know, my first taste of, of actually what I've now come to love and do all the time. Well, that's interesting. I always thought, uh, somebody asked me a question once, I forget who it was, uh, asked me a question that if I could be an Olympic athlete, so of all the sports that you've ever touched upon and knowing what you know, you know which, which sport do you think you could have been quite good at? And for me, I keep coming back to rowing. Because uh, I've got quite long mm -hmm. limbs. I mean, I'm not big like Cracknell or somebody, but I've got quite long limbs. And even without any training, I can bust out respectable times on an ergo. And I do wonder whether I would like that hideous place that is a pain cave uh, while rowing. Because um, it's, 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 yeah. And I know quite yeah, they... a lot of ex-pro rowers. Uh, and and they're all, they are all massive, aren't they? They're, they're, they're big boys. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd definitely fall down on that one. So if you could compete in the Olympics, here we go. If you could compete in the Olympics in any one sport, what would it be? Um, I think now it would be cycling because I, I, um, I do actually feel like I've got a lot of power in cycling. Um, and But I've, all of those, all, you know, the thing is for me, it's like, is maintaining the fun and the passion of it. And I feel like often if you do something, you know, Olympic cyclists, for example, they don't ever get to just like go out for a ride mm. and just go and, you know, the kind of thing that, that I love. And even now, actually, I'm I'm rediscovering so many of the sports that I know you want to come into Chamonix and stuff like that in, in you know, coming up, but I'm rediscovering a totally different side to almost every single sport that I've done in the last 10 years because my mindset and what I'm doing it for has changed. Whereas before I was kind of like, you know, if I was going for a bike ride, I was probably training for an endurance challenge. So all my bike rides would have been like a hundred mile bike ride where you don't stop, you know, at like when you see a beautiful pub garden for a quick shandy or you don't stop for a nice lunch, you just like in and out. And, um, you know, even just like climbing and when I would, you know, when I used to go climbing in Chamonix, I'd always want to stop at the top and have a picnic and just enjoy the view. And it was always this rush to get back down. And, you know, now I feel so much, you know, even just living there, there was so much pressure from the people that I met to, you know, climb at a certain standard or cycle at a certain speed. And, you know, if you don't climb or you don't ski or you don't um, cycle at my level, then I'm not going to go out with you. And I personally just love the, there's so many things. And this is probably where my philosophy comes in, but just the feeling of feeling alive and being outside and being with nature. And, you know, all of that is just as important to me as actually just challenging yourself. And, and you know, I, that's why also why I've got the van now, because yeah. I want to just adventure on a different level. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're coming out to Chamonix in a minute. I mean, I know that you lived in Chamonix for what, two, three years? 
Um, it was actually less than that. It was about a year in total. Okay, because I, I lived there for I don't know seven, eight years or so, um, and, and I do know what you mean with, within the valley. There, it is full of these incredible people and an incredible energy, but at the same time, and it's quite hard to. A lot of people say to me, you know, do you miss Chamonix? And of course I miss my time in Chamonix. At the same time, there's part of me that doesn't miss it. Uh, mm. it, it it's just a funny place. It's, it's a beautiful place. Uh, but it's, um, it, it's an interesting community there. Uh, but as, you know, as, as you say, you know, there is a, a, a lot uh, of energy in there. So um, I, I know that you sort of quit your job and decided that you did you immediately move out to Chamonix? Okay, so what happened was um, I was sort of like knocking on my boss's door the whole time being like, come on, please, I want another opportunity. By this point, when I quit, I was um, I was running the commercial division for the UK's fastest growing tech startup. So right. we'd built a company from three years, from like 10 employees to 100 to 150. You know, it was, the growth was amazing. So it was kind of like, if you imagine on the one hand, I was constantly growing because I was constantly challenging myself, constantly doing these amazing, you know, things to push and to grow and learn. And then I was coming back into my work and putting that into my work. And it was just like creating this great dynamic um, of motivation and drive and growth, really. And so I wanted to kind of continue that journey. But my company was changing and they basically said to me, what we want you to do is just do the same thing you've done for the last three years. Just manage your team you know, just buy out your time. You've got your share options. If you wait another year or and a half, we'll have sold the, the, the shares and, you know, you can make some money and then go and do what you want to do. <clears throat> and, uh, and I decided <laughs> not to wait <laughs> and forgo my share options and leave all of that behind and, um, and just uh, send my ship sailing basically out into the deep waters and see what happened next. And I was 27. I thought, you know, if not now, when? And if I you know, make that sacrifice, you know, now to sort of to stay and to choose money and security, then I might always make that decision. And I and I wanted to go out and I believe there was another story for me. And I kind of had built the confidence and the courage to go and do it. Mm. So I, I did, I quit my job and I threw myself out into the deep waters. And of course, it was like the most petrifying thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> um, you know, you, you burn through money incredibly quickly when you are not earning any um even if you like cut out all of your outgoings you just spend it very quickly but i i knew i wanted to change my life and i wanted to live a life that was more on my terms i dreamed of running my own business i dreamed of building a youth empowerment project but more than that i didn't want to be living in london and have this this nine to five you know london corporate life i wanted to live in chamonix and um, interestingly, when I lived there, people always say, why did you choose Chamonix over, you know, any other mountain town you could have moved to? And I was like, no, I never even wanted to move to the mountains. I wanted to live in Chamonix because it was just this magical place to me that seemed like, you know, the place where you would just meet like minded people and go on an amazing adventures and and, you know, and I, 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 for me, it was super important to be around like-minded people that wanted to cultivate the same work-life balance and the same kind of aspirations in life. So, yeah, I quit my job. I think it was about a year, actually, um, before I did actually move to Chamonix full time. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and there I was. And uh, then I went off on this Alpine coast to coast expedition. And, um, and when you moved to Chamonix, uh, you were married to Charlie at the time, weren't you? Yeah. Um, and then that, for for whatever reason, you you, you both went your separate ways. Uh, yeah. Ch Charlie's still in Chamonix. You kind of realise that maybe the scene. So, I mean, I'm just trying to work out you know what it was because having lived in Chamonix myself, I, I can kind of understand that it's not quite perhaps what everybody thought. I mean, you just found yeah. that you those like-minded people weren't quite clicking, or, or yeah, I'm just curious, what was the catalyst to come home? Well, the catalyst to come home was just that I, all my opportunities were actually coming from the UK. Uh, I know um, that feeling. Yeah, right, you know that feeling. And so you're, you're coming back and you're doing this. And I think that I missed it. I think that I turned into Challenge Sophie and I forgot about Sophie. 
you know, and I almost thought like if I tear up the rule book and, and then I realized, you know, and I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but it's part of sort of like the growth of life. But I was like, I wanted to reconnect with, with myself and I wanted to reconnect with my friends and family. And, you know, but I think in the essence of it, it didn't totally align with me that like genuinely people would come over to, to for dinner at my house. And this is something that I found really difficult. And they would sit at dinner at my house and say, if you weren't leading, you weren't climbing that route. And I just thought that kind of level of sort of like judgment and snobbery, I really just didn't, didn't like at all. Because I was like, just because I'm not leading a climb doesn't mean that it's not worthy or it's not valid or I haven't climbed it or I haven't achieved something. Like I was still out there doing it and that's my decision. Like genuinely, I, I prefer to second because that means that I get to actually climb more challenging routes mm -hmm. and have more of an adventure, you know? rather than like leading and, and um, anyway, we're getting really technical on the climbing here, but well, well, no, yeah, that's just- it, it, No, 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 Tommy, it's, it's quite easy to explain to the listeners, viewers. Um, I think what you're trying to say is, now in Chamonix people are saying, well, if you're not going first, if you're not putting the bolt, uh, the, the clips in the bolts or putting the protection in and take, you know, and putting the rope up in place, then you're, you're not really meeting the challenge to their expectations. Whereas exactly. you had your own level of personal expectation and what you wanted yeah. out of the adventure and you were exactly. very comfortable going first or not leading and, and you were looking you know your personal challenge was perhaps the technical difficulties or the aesthetics of the route exactly. as opposed to the, the one going first and and forcing yeah. the route yeah or, or the the achievement or the experience or being out in nature like all that kind of stuff and so it was really nice for me when I came back because I got to go up to Scotland and I went, I went climbing um, with this guy up there who's, who was ice climbing for the British team. And he just went out for me on a day route and we had the most amazing day. And he, you know, he was just like singing and happy and like totally just, you know, it was just, it was how I, I was like, wow, that's amazing. Like you're not thinking that this is below you because you could climb harder. You're just enjoying the fact that we're going out and, and you know, and having this great day out in the mountains together. So, um, yeah, that was, uh, you know, been really cool to just like experience things on a different way. And um, my life has been insane since I moved back from from Chamonix, taking me to all corners of the world and doing like all kinds of crazy stuff. It's just, I mean, it's a bit of a whirlwind, really. It, yeah, it, it is. And I, I just want to go back and perhaps, um, you know, draw a line under what you were saying about adventure, because I, I do get a little bit upset when people have... So a pre, they have their own predetermined idea about what it, it should look like or the boxes yeah. that should be ticked for yeah. another individual to come up to their own standards. Whereas the way that I certainly look at life now, it, it, it's, it's your own standards that, that matter. And it's whether you are happy with what you've done. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter about everybody else. And okay, I'm trying to get back into rock climbing, for instance, right now. I, I'm just starting going back out rock climbing. I'm not rock climbing as hard as I used to. And I'm no. sure there's people out there going, oh, God, look at Kenton. You know, he's, he's not really participating in a sport anymore. He's not climbing at the grades he used to. But I'd say my enjoyment now is as much, if not more, because mm. I am doing it on my terms and I'm loving what it is I'm doing. Uh, and I think, that's the, I think that's the important yeah. thing, not to be get not to get hung up on other people's expectations, but be confident, yeah. like you've been saying, be confident that this, this, is, this is what I do and this is why, and, and I'm enjoying it because of it. Um, so it's, it's beautiful to, to hear from her. Yeah. Now, I know. And it's, oh, go on. Now, I was going to say, I know through your social media that you have a deep-seated love affair with Scotland. So where does that oh. come from? Because you're originally from London, are you not? You went to college yeah. in Leeds, or you went to uni in Leeds. Then you moved back to London. What is yeah. it? Every time you go to Scotland, there, there's... You can just tell it in your prose and the pictures that you come alive when you go to Scotland. Oh. What is it about Bonnie Scotland? Oh, I miss Scotland so much. Um, okay, it's it's the fact that, that we have this wilderness right there on our doorstep. And I think that's amazing. Like 
you know, you can be so in the middle of nowhere up there and so remote. I love that. Um, you know, you don't have to go to Alaska, all these far flung places to get where you can get in Scotland. I love like how welcoming people are there. It's just so beautiful. Glencoe is my favorite place on the planet and my heart genuinely swells when I get there as though I'm in love and I think I am in love with Glencoe I just love it I'm not, um, I think I'm, I'm not sure Glencoe is um uh, 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 uh I've lost my train of thought now but no you're absolutely right it, it's so beautiful isn't it, it, it you come around the, so you come beautiful. over around it more and then you, you oh. come around those air spends in the car or come across it on the train and bop yeah there. I love the sleeper train to Scotland. It's one of my favourite things in the whole entire world to do. And it, I think actually a lot of adventure for me almost takes me back to, to being a child. And not that I did adventuring, but when I was a child, I used to like take my bike and pack a little rucksack and go and have a picnic, you know, cycle a mile down the road and have a picnic in the field with the horses. And that was like my big adventure. And, um, and when I'm in Scotland, I feel like that. I feel like yeah, I've packed my bag and I've gotten on the on the on the train. I'm on my adult version of the Polar Express. <laughs> you know, except now it's really fun because I've got my own cabin. I'm drinking whiskey and you know I get to do whatever I want. And then you arrive there and you go and climb a mountain and you got your little ham and cheese sandwich and you know you pack it with crisps and it just I just love it. I feel so alive there. I, I have so many friends there that I've made throughout the years. I feel that people are extremely welcoming. Um, there's no judgment. I've never, ever had any judgment from anybody in Scotland of sort of, you know, levels and all this kind of thing or what it is and what it isn't to do something. Um, and, um, yeah, it's just the feeling of, of, of it. And I think that just like I said, the fact that it's there and it's accessible to all of us, these highlands, um, is something that, that I think is amazing to take, take the, to take advantage of. Mm. Yeah, it is amazing. I was up there a number of years ago and we were doing a small uh, like promo video for a brand that I, I used to be associated with. And Neil Gresham, the, the, the amazing all-round British climber that we have who lives up in the lakes, uh, he was talking about the, the Scottish mountains saying that they may be small, but they really pack a punch. And he is absolutely yes. right, because you need to be on your game in Scotland, don't you? The weather, absolutely. because of a maritime system, can change like this. Yeah. You'll be in the car park in sunshine, then it's rain, then it's sleet, then yeah. it's snow, then it's howling gals, then it's sunshine. Yeah. The navigation can be desperately difficult. You can be up to here in a bog. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's quite a um, it's quite the place to cut your teeth. It uh, is. Certainly in terms it of is. It, you know, and everyone says that they're like, if you can ski in Scotland, if you can climb in Scotland, you can climb anywhere in the world. And you know, gosh, I mean, the the weather is crazy, and I think that's it as well. Like my I get central to my like mindset of life is you know if you work I like to work for things I like to set challenges I like to feel like I've achieved things and in Scotland you do that like if you get to the top of the mountain I was on the summit of Ben Nevis um and the, the last like two or three hours was a complete and utter whiteout standing on the summit everything's completely covered in snow it's November there's nobody else up there and all of a sudden the clouds completely shifted to the most beautiful sunset and it it's a moment. I've literally got like um, chills in the back of my neck talking about that, but it's a brief moment in history. So many of them exist. And on that one moment, you just happen to be on the summit just to, just to grasp it and just to stop and feel like, isn't the world just such an incredible place and the beauty unfolding. And I love that. I love those, those moments when you do get that good weather and you think, you know, I'm, I'm so lucky because it's not like this all the time. <laughs> no, it's not. It and I suppose you've got to be a little bit careful, but I also remember being at the top of uh, Ben Nevis, is going back years and years and years ago. Uh, we, we had a Slovenian exchange of climates, and we'd been climbing on the North Bay, it's been horrible conditions, and exactly the same thing, it cleared. And then all of a sudden, mm. the vista, you could see out to sky, uh, it was just all there in front of it. Mm. It was the most magnificent thing um, ever. But I, I think at the same time, you've got to be careful. I'd, Reading a fantastic book at the moment called The Art of the Good Life um, by um, oh, it's a Swiss author. Um, anyway, come back to me. And um, he's talking about the subtle, not, not subtle differences, but experiences against memories. And it's really interesting. He was mm. saying that memories, we really only remember the real highlights 
and the end of whatever the activity mm -hmm. is. We might also remember the pitfalls, you know, the, the real lows, and we might remember the start. And it's so true. And he was saying, focus more on the experience yeah. at the time. Because on our deathbed, we're not going to remember all those things. Okay? Our brain yeah. only has the capacity to remember so much. So don't necessarily do it for the memory, maybe not do it for the gram or the you know, Instagram, do it for yeah. the gram, but do it for the experience. And that's a very yeah. personal thing. That's, that's you in the moment experiencing whatever it is, which is you on top yeah. of Ben Nevis watching the, uh, yeah. the sunset in November. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I'm a big whiskey fan as well. Oh, so, are you? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Go, go, go. So what, what would, uh, what would uh, Sophie's top... Let, I'll give you the top three. Go on. Can, can you narrow it down for three off the top of your head? Um, was, that, was that an um, impossible I love, task? I love Talisker. Um, I love... Actually, love, I quite like Monkey Shoulder as well. Oh, uh, Monkey Shoulder. Um, I did some work for them years ago. It's a blended whiskey, though, is it not? It's, it's more of a mixer. It's more, it is, it is more of a, you know, just sort of, yeah, it's not like a really amazing uh, whiskey. It's really, and then they, actually, they have something called a ginger monkey. Was it mo ginger monkey? Uh, ginger, monkey ginger, uh, something like that. They, they've got some great cocktails. If you go on their website, they've got some like classic oh, monkey shoulder uh, cocktails, which are well worth trying out. Okay, so you've got monkey shoulder, Talisker, and what were you Yeah, doing? and then last, uh, last year, a friend of mine, walk, we walked through the snow over the moors for like, a whole day to get to the Glenlivet distillery. Oh, nice. And, then, and we got there and we were like covered in snow and we had so much fun. And, you know, oh. but that's, that's a prime example. We didn't tick off any routes on our, t you know, on our list. We didn't go and achieve like, you know, a mountain that, that people would be impressed by. We had such a fun adventure, just the two of us, just walking over the moors to the Glenlivet distillery. And then we got there and we tried all the whiskeys and somebody who worked there gave us a lift back home. and. Uh -huh. You know, just just a great day out. Um, I, I, I love mean, whiskey. Things. Gives me the most horrendous hangover ever. Does it? I don't know if there's a beer in the build-up to it or uh, yeah, but oof, I, I struggle a little bit with. I, I've got some. I've had some fantastic, like you, t you know, experiences drinking whiskey, and I do find it very sociable. But at the same time. Gives me yeah. the most cracking. Oh, no, day. that's bad. That is uh, bad. You I don't. struggle with that. And then, okay, so so with or without water? I know that's a, a bone of contention sometimes, isn't it? It's a bone of contention. Um, I like it with a with a dash of water for sure. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't know that. So that, that, that's, that's one that's one thing that I've I've learned tonight. So um, where are we? Um, your iron. I suppose it is an Iron Man, isn't it? I mean, he's not yeah. an Iron Woman or an Iron... It's an no. Iron Man. Um, eighth place overall in your category. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> and that was in your first uh, one, was it not? I forgot about that. You just said it. I was like, yeah, that did happen. I forgot. <laughs> It was my first Iron Man, yeah. And that was, and, and that's the, the one in Wales, so that's in and around Tenby, so it's a, a, an ocean swim and yeah. a notoriously hilly ride it's really brutal actually ironman wales um so why i went back and did it twice mm, not so sure um no it's, it's an amazing ironman but it is yeah it's it's really uh it's hard it's hilly wet windy um but the support is incredible from the locals they all come in the in the town and they get progressively kind of more inebriated throughout the day and um oh it was just amazing like to be honest, I I actually remember one of my very first challenges. I met an Iron Man, and this was a guy who runs his own business, and he just used to do an Iron Man like every year. And I just thought it was like God, you know. I just thought that is incredible. To you know, the thought of doing that would just blow my mind. Never in a million years imagined that I could do it. And but it was always there as sort of like a pinnacle of something that I wanted to achieve. And I'd done a couple of triathlons and I'd really loved it. And I was getting into cycling and stuff. And I actually read this book called 17 Hours to Glory because you have 17 hours to complete an Ironman. Yeah. And I finished reading the book and there were all these incredible stories of 60-year-old um, nuns that had done it or a guy that was pushing his um, disabled son in a wheelchair and just such amazing stories. And I thought, you know, maybe I should give it a go too. 
So I signed up for it. Um, and then I actually went out to Chamonix and I just like climbed some mountains, did a couple of bike rides in the summer. And then I came back to the UK and it was like eight weeks to go. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't done any running. Um, and I thought, oh, I should probably do some, I didn't have really done much swimming. And I thought I should probably do some training. So I found a coach, an amazing guy called Iron Mate Mark. And he just, he helped me out. Oh, sorry, what's his name? Iron Mate Mark? Yeah, he's a real legend. Um, he's just done like more triathlons and Ironman than you can possibly imagine. And uh, he gave me a bit of a training schedule. And then I just, I kind of, and I kind of just sometimes just go and do things because for me, like my mental strength is is quite strong. Um, so I can like push my body to places where it probably I probably haven't done enough training to do it but because my mental game is strong then I can push through um and I think that's you know that's kind of what I really found in the Ironman is like what it comes down to is is the last half of the of the marathon you know that's where everybody starts dropping like flies right. and at that point it doesn't matter how what your marathon time is or how fast you can run a 10k it matters can you keep going when you are so deep in that pain cave and and you know you 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 just that's when like your head is just sort of exploding, and you you've got to keep going, oh. um, and that's really why I come into my own is in that last se- section, and that's actually for me it's the magic of it. Like I want to get myself to that place where I'm at rock bottom, where I feel completely empty, the tank is empty, and I want to I want to to experiment with myself and see what goes on between my mind and my body, and how I can keep myself moving forward despite everything screaming, like, what on earth are you doing? This hurts so much. Mm. I just want to be in bed kind of thing. Um, and I think that's where the magic happens, really. That's where you change and you grow and you you just come out of it so much stronger. And then, you know, you become an Ironman and it's really cool and you get the medal and, you know, it's an amazing experience. Change change your life. Did, did you get a tattoo as well? I read there's some no. percentage of people get a tattoo. Uh, I know. I'm I not didn't saying again, tattoos tattoo. are stupid, but it, it, it's a really high proportion, isn't it? People cross the line, get the uh, the trademark M and the uh, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. But, uh, no, it, it's, it's really interesting. And um, it's good. I, I was doing a little bit of research and I was look, looking at various videos of your website and things like that. And there is, so I'm, I'm super fascinated in this now that you're saying, you know, your, your personal resilience and it's the last half of the marathon, which really makes me want to, go and test that myself to a degree, although I don't really want to do the swim. I'd, I'd be rubbish at the swim. Um, mm-hmm. I can hardly swim. Anyway, um, but, but I, I came across a video of you running um, or training for the London Marathon, and you clearly weren't in a great place. I think it looks like you're running along the embankment or somewhere, and you're in tears. And mm. you were talking about letting other people down. Mm. And I'm just curious about your relationship between your own personal resilience, which is obviously immense, but that also that the other connection that you have with those perhaps who are around you and those who are supporting you it's, it's clearly something that, that that is it means a lot to you so i was just curious yeah. about, about where, where those relationships sit with one another yeah definitely i mean over so basically like over the last couple of years since i kind of did the alpine coast to coast challenge and moved back from from chamonix um like I put a huge amount of energy into creating Challenge Sophie in my life and trailblazers and, you know, trying to um, add value to my community and, you know, just really like build this life and this this force for good to try and create change because I am a massive advocate for change and that's, you know, a huge driving force in me. Um, and so lots of opportunities start coming my way, which has been amazing. You know, so many fantastic opportunities. And I sometimes take on too much you know then and then you yeah I know you're smiling you know what it's like right I I know exactly what yeah yeah and you think okay um you know the craziest that I literally after I did the London Marathon the next day I was giving a talk for my you know nine o'clock in the morning giving a talk at my cousin's school you know it's like stuff like that like why did I do that to myself you know but you you think okay I've got a day in my diary I can do it you know and uh and and basically some point I would get a bit burnt out and think 
actually, I've probably taken on too much. I've probably committed to too many things here and, you know, wanting to do a really good job. Like I am the type of person that under promises and over delivers. Like I want to always do a really good job. I care passionately about every single project that I work on and, you know, really getting into understanding, you know, why it's important and what, how I can help with that. And, um, yeah so that's kind of what was happening was that I was doing the London Marathon training and then also thinking the whole time of like all the things that I should be doing sat at my desk and just working out the the combination between that between physically training for the challenges and then also you know keep building your business is is not an easy easy task. No I mean it is it, it, absolutely desperate and it, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting one that you're saying there uh, you I, I'm going to I can get your word in a little bit wrong, so so step in. Um, you under promise, over deliver, or so, or something like that. You you were just saying, but I, I think that's actually a, a very good uh, philosophy for life. You know, promise little, but then deliver everything. Uh, and I yeah. I find myself personally kind of the other way around a little bit. I, I'm a yes person. I find it very hard to say no. So I find I'm, I'm totally stacked up with stuff and it's mayhem to try to, you know, like you were saying, you were delivering a talk at nine o'clock the day after doing the London Marathon. Yeah. So I now, there's a couple of ways I deal with it. I spoke, spoke about it a little bit last week, but you know, the, the five second rule, you know, something comes in, think about it or even sleep on it. Yeah. And, and then you know, don't be, people I think arguably respect you more for saying no than saying yes sometimes. 100%. And, it, and it's that it, sort of not compromising all the time. Because I find myself, I end up compromising you know, what I do personally because I've promised so much to other people. It's, it's a difficult yeah. one. It's a, it's and um, have you told your, your listeners or your viewers about the sign that you have in your house? Oh, the hell yeah. I, I think yeah. I have. Um, yeah, the, the, the one above the, uh, the door there. The, the hell yeah! Yeah. No, it's, it's isn't it not... If it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. exactly. Yeah, so something comes yeah. in the inbox, and if it, I mean, I'm yeah. looking at it, and it could be an opportunity to do something or a request for do something, or you know, and I'm reading it. If I if I don't immediately think hell yes, yeah. I want to do that, yeah. it's a no. Yeah, and that's that's my filter, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's a it's uh, I take a picture of it every now and then and stick it on on social media. As I come down the steps from my my bedroom, it's there. The the hell yes, it was a present from Jazz, uh, my wife when we moved in, and it's it's right there. I see it every single day, and that is my yeah. my compass on my yeah. decision making on opportunity that comes my way. It's got to be worthy of everybody's. Um, time and energy yeah. otherwise I think you end up letting not only yourself down but your peers or your colleagues or or, or the, the, the client whoever it is you, you let them yeah. down because I'm a firm believer in everything that we do and you, you said it beautifully everything we do we should over deliver and we should deliver yeah. on time and when those yeah. two don't, don't come together then ultimately you are potentially letting people down um, yeah and also you're building a brand as well you know I I want people in the you know to be respected for for my work for the quality of my work for my commitment and you know for all this kind of stuff so that obviously you build a positive brand that's pretty important to me um yeah no it, it is hard the other thing that I think is hard is that some of the most the best um opportunities that have come my way have come out of the most obscure things that I did you know it's like that one talk that you could look back and think, yeah, I probably could have not gone to that one because, you know, you did it, whatever, for whatever reason. That was the one where someone was sitting in the audience and writes to you a year later and is like, do you want to be involved in this project? So it's very difficult because, you you know, you, you always think, gosh, is that going to be the one thing that leads to something else? But, 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 but yeah, I think that, then, that's the danger of the what if. Uh, you, you, you can live your is. life with that. I mean, what if I win the lottery? Well, the chance yeah. of winning the lottery, yeah, it's, you've just got to find the balance, haven't you? Yeah, and, exactly. You know, I, I'm a firm yeah. believer in saying, you need to be brave enough to say no. Not, not in a yeah. nasty, malicious way, but just in a, in a nice way. You, you've got to have some filter parameters 
on yeah. uh, on what we say yes to. Um, Definitely, which is, uh, yeah. Which is always really important. So um, to, just to, to go back to your trailblazers, because this is something which I, I just think is incredible. Uh, and I don't want to labour it with the uh, viewers and listeners, but the trailblazers, I remember we were talking last year a little bit and you were pushing really hard on essentially the campaign trail to fundraise. Uh, so mm -hmm. the, the, the money for the trailblazers, wh wh where does that come in? come in from you were working really hard on this last year I, I know that yeah yeah it's, it's actually been really hard because um I had really big dreams for trailblazers and this is like in the beginning when I started it um and I had but I had to take on all of the roles so it was my job to kind of like fundraise basically just do everything um and it was really hard like I know there's a lot of government funding out there but it's you know even just applying for a grant is like more than a day's work in itself um and they're sort of often very specific and if you don't know if you're not in that industry if you don't know that industry then it's you know it's it's hard I'm not in that industry what I do know is um brands you know collaborating with brands and getting sponsorship from brands for specific projects so that was really my routine was that I went to a lot of brands that I was working with and was like you know the values of what we're trying to create here and you know the content that you're going to get from it and just try to get them on board with what I was trying to achieve so you know had fantastic feedback from the likes of Ellis Brigham and Blacks and you know lots of brands and um, Keen, who a uh, footwear company who would um, supported me for the last couple of years with Trailblazers. And I just, um, I actually, to be honest, I got quite, it got really, really stressful. I haven't felt that level of stress for a very long time. And I actually just substituted um, like my own money. Like when brands were um, sponsoring me to do stuff, I just put that money towards Trailblazers instead because. I wanted to find the money for it, and um, and yeah, I think everything else just, just took such a long time. Mm. Well, well it, it is. I mean, it, it's it's a fact that one of the most powerful things that we can do, one of the most enriching things we can do in life, is to give back, whether it's through yeah. volunteering or whether it's through setting up something like that you have there. So, it's uh, it's something I'm 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 pretty much in awe of, and you know, I was certainly following what you were doing with Trailblazers last year. And uh, yeah, for, for, for the lucky girls that did get the opportunity, it, it, looked, it looked incredible, it, um, mm -hmm. it, it, it really did. So, so, what, so what does the future for Trailblazers look like? Or are you in a situation like many of us right now, we just don't know exactly what the future looks like. Have you plans moving forward for, for Trailblazers? I, yeah, I mean, I don't know, like, like you said, like everybody, no idea really what the future holds. But I've been using this time during lockdown to lay some really solid foundations and to actually think about, you know, really almost go back to basics and get really philosophical about like, what is it I stand for? Why is that important? You know, and and how can that help people? And how can I communicate that best? Um, and I started writing my book and I've started like investigating more opportunities and collaborations with trailblazers and thinking about um, ways in which I want to move it forward. And I guess really one of the key driving things for me is that I feel, you know, I'm in my early 30s now. If I look back on my life, I learned a lot in education and that was great. But the stuff that's changed my life and that's, you know, grown me into the person I am today has all been things that I've learned in the last 15 years um since uh you know and, and a lot of it's been outdoors in the in the mountains now we know that you know growth and education and personal development through the outdoors that's a known concept mm. that's been going on for for many 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 years um but I wanted to take that in a new way to girls in the city London girls hopefully boys in the future too been doing some work across um across the pond in the USA with a program over there as well but I wanted to really distill it and be like, what are the skills that young people need to navigate in the modern world that they're not being taught in, 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 uh, in schools? And I think that it's so much, it, it, there's so much scope. Like even just, you know, everything that's happened with Black Lives Matter, even just helping people figure out what they're passionate about in life and learn how to campaign for something or how to, you know, manage money. Like there's so many areas of trailblazers that could be developed. 
Um, but for me, the key central part of it is this getting outside, challenging yourself, you know, creating that community and that identity together mm. and just going and having fun. So I think that hopefully some more sailing trips, um, you know, take some girls up to Scotland. That's a big dream of mine. And, you know, just getting them away from, from their normal lives and going and doing incredible things that are not, don't have to be epic, but they're incredible because they're simple and they're connecting them and their experiences and their opportunities to, to develop a new identity that they feel proud of. But, but I mean, I think the interesting thing, it can be epic for the individual. So because it's not epic for you know, this is what we talked about earlier. So because it's not Absolutely. epic for one person doesn't mean it can't be epic for another. Uh, and, and that's what we often forget about. It's interesting. Yeah. We, we've got to, at some stage, tie these tie these all up. And as, uh, as I said, there's so much I want to talk about. But I, I was listening to a podcast with uh, the uh, the American Adam Robinson uh, the other day, and um, you know, he was talking about fun and how important it is for fun when it comes to teaching and learning. Uh, mm. And it, 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 if you can make something fun, then it certainly elevates the sort of accepted level of the person doing the learning. But the other thing which he said, which I found very profound is, is that we're never actually taught how to learn. Mm. We're told what to learn, yeah. but we're yeah. never taught how to learn. So and that really stuck with me. Uh, yeah. And, and that, that's so a really interesting, interesting thing. Because we, we, we're often spoon-fed. You need to do Absolutely. this. Absolutely. But yeah. it's, it's been, being told or being taught how to actually learn. And that's a really, really powerful thing. Um, yeah. Really powerful. It's one of the things that with Trailblazers so that I think has really ignited the girls and engaged them. Because they're so used to, like you said, people saying, you need to do this to get to X, Y, and Z. You know, their whole lives are like that. Whether it's on social media, looking a certain way or through the academic pressure at school. Now I go in there and I say, this is about you. This is your journey. You are determining where you want to get to. You're going to determine how you're going to get there. I am going to give you the, the kind of the inspiration and the support and the tools to do it. Mm. And it's really liberating for them to feel like they're in control of that and they're moving forward. They're not coming to another class where they sit there you know, we talk about stuff together. We literally get them to open up and be like, what do you guys think is going on with this? I'm not walking in there and saying, you know, um, social media is bad for you. Don't use social media. It can, you know, like they have, schools often do that. They get all kinds of experts to come in to try and get young people to not use social media or whatever it is. And I'm doing the opposite. I'm going in there and saying, you know, what do you think and what, how do you want to change from here? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah I, think, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that, that's one of the... Um, oh, I completely lost my train of thought. God, this happens every now and then. When I have too much coffee, <laughs> you know, people say coffee really focuses you. I, I've had so much coffee today. I'm so wired. My, my brain cells are firing in all sorts of different directions. I have completely and utterly lost my train of thought. Okay, um, let's get to one of your, your new questions that you've got going on. What else have well, you got Well, at, at some stage, we've got to, uh, we, 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 do, we do have to bring this, um, you know, we do have to bring this ship uh, back to dock. Um, oh, I just remember something. Can I just say something quickly? Of course you can. Yeah, we, we've okay. got no, yeah, go on. Because it just popped into my mind what you're saying about having fun, okay? Now, what's the quote? The, the best climber is the one that's having uh, the most fun. Slow. Yeah, the, the, the late, great Alex Lowe. And we're talking about him with Conrad. And the quote is, you're, you're absolutely right. And I meant, thank you so much for reminding me. I meant to bring this up with Conrad the other day. So the late, great Alex Lowe, who died in an avalanche with Conrad um, on Shushapang, was once asked a question, who is the best climber in the world today? And his response was? The best climber is the one that's having the most fun. And that is a perfect place to leave it today. Sophie, yeah. I cannot thank you enough. There's so many little gems of wisdom in there. Uh, I, you know, I think what you're doing with Trailblazers is awesome. Um, we haven't even touched upon, okay, just in a, in a very quick nutshell, what is challenge Sophie got up her sleeve when lockdown eases? Just, just very, very briefly. I just want to take my van and go to Scotland. I want to learn to surf. I just want to enjoy life and see my friends and family. It's, it's like you said, it's the simple, it's the experiences. It's having fun. <laughs> it, 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 exactly that. It's bringing it back to basics 
and yeah. having fun. And by the sounds of it, perhaps a, a dram or two of, uh, of oh, yeah. whiskey as well. <laughs> Uh, in there. Listen, yeah. uh, so I can't thank you enough uh, for giving up your uh, your afternoon to to be part of Cool Conversations. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've certainly admired you from afar. I know we've only uh, connected a couple of times properly, but uh, you know, I really do respect not only what you're doing, uh, but also your ethos on how you're doing it. So um, yeah, just keep on rocking, won't you? Oh, thanks so much, Kenton. This has made my day. It's been amazing, and uh, yeah. Keep doing what you're doing too, and hopefully we'll get to climb a mountain together soon. Well, you never know. Uh, you never know. They're, they're going to open up one day soon, I tell you. And when they do, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the first one there. I'm going I'm <laughs> to be. I'm going to be forging my way, I'll trailblazing my way to the top. That yes, I can assure you. Exactly. That I can assure you. Right. Well, thank right. you so much. You you're so welcome. Enjoy the rest of time, and let's speak soon. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Brilliant. How cool is Sophie? I mean, honestly. So impressed with what she's doing um, from having the courage and the conviction to walk out of her job with all those benefits that she had lined up, uh, to take on those new challenges. And, and now what she's doing with Trailblazers, trying to empower you know, the next generation, uh, especially the girls coming through, is, is quite sensational. Loads and loads and loads of things in there that we can take away. Don't forget, um, we are here every week. Uh, we are doing this uh, for your enjoyment. Of course, all the content is, is online. If you've missed anything, you can catch up again on my uh, YouTube channel. Just you know, look for Cool Conversations. And it's also now as a wonderful podcast. So you don't have to see uh, my ugly face, at least, uh, while you're listening to, uh, to these wonderful guests that we have. We are back here next week. So please don't miss us. Uh, we're same place, Barn Theatre in Silencester, same place, same time next week. Thanks. <laughs>